Surely there was a time on an ancient savanna when hungry beasts hunted our ancestors. Perhaps the hot breath of carnivores once drove our own evolution and made us faster, stronger, or smarter. But today, we have only one kind of predator left to fear. Microorganisms that cause disease consume us from the inside out. The human body is the food that fuels their rapid-fire reproduction. Some bacteria can reproduce a million times more quickly than we do. These microscopic predators have cast a long, dark shadow on our history. The bacteria that caused tuberculosis riddled the bodies of Egyptian nobles over 4,000 years ago. Another microbe spawned the dreaded Black Death. In the 14th century, bubonic plague killed one in three Europeans. The influenza virus claimed some 20 million lives on the heels of World War I. We were virtually defenseless against infectious disease until recently. This is a battlefield, a battlefield in man's total war against disease. Here, man has locked his heaviest artillery against premature death, antibiotics, the miracle drugs of our time. In the 20th century, scientists began to focus on the chemicals that microbes produce to attack each other. Perhaps some of these compounds would kill disease organisms without harming the human body. The first so-called antibiotic, penicillin, saved countless lives in World War II. Now doctors had a weapon to fight the infections that commonly killed soldiers wounded on the battlefield. By the 1950s, hundreds of antibiotics were on the market. Defeating deadly germs seemed like child's play. In 1969, the U.S. Surgeon General declared it was time to close the book on infectious disease. He spoke too soon. The Russian prison system is ground zero of a new epidemic. An old killer is back with a vengeance. Since the collapse of the Soviet Union, Russia's incarceration rate has soared to the highest in the world. More than one million inmates are confined to a penal system designed for a fraction of that number. But overcrowding, poor nutrition, and scant sanitation are not the worst of a prisoner's nightmares. Now, tuberculosis stalks these men. <coughs> the bacteria that cause TB can lie dormant for decades in a healthy person. But if the immune system is weakened, the microbes begin to multiply and consume the lungs. Prisoners are malnourished, many of them are alcoholics, many of them are smokers. And just the stress of being in prison, all these factors together make you very, very susceptible to probably not only being infected with TB, but also coming down with active disease. When a person with active TB coughs, or even speaks, he expels contagious droplets that linger in the air for hours. The next victim needs only to inhale to be infected. At least 100,000 inmates have active TB. But antibiotics are in short supply. Many men will die before their terms are up.
Sasha Bilyevich is serving time for his second burglary conviction in Tomsk, a city in western Siberia. His four-year term now seems like a death sentence. I never thought I'd be infected. I never gave it much thought. At first, I didn't believe what the doctor told me. I thought that maybe it was any other illness, but not tuberculosis. Diagnosed during his first prison term, Sasha was given antibiotics. He improved, but after his release, he stopped getting treatment. Now his TB is back, but the same drugs cannot cure him. The microbes in his body have evolved. When Sasha first took antibiotics, the drugs killed off most of the TB bacteria. But when his treatment stopped, it left some microbes alive, the ones that were most resistant to the drugs. As these survivors multiplied, all their offspring acquired that same resistance. An entirely new strain of bacteria evolved, untreatable with standard drugs. Sasha is now beyond help by prison doctors. He's not alone. At least 30,000 Russian inmates have multi-drug resistant TB, and their numbers are growing. This epidemic has brought Alex Goldfarb from New York back to his homeland. Working with Russian authorities, he's developing a pilot program in the Tomsk prison to change the way TB is treated. This prison system is the ideal incubator for those drug-resistant strains. Russians have been using inadequate um, treatment regimens, particularly in prisons, for the past decade. They use uh, low-quality drug, they never finish the uh, treatment course, and as the result, these resistant strains are spreading on their own through coughing, and that's a major problem. For drug-resistant cases, Goldfarb has a small supply of so-called second-line drugs. Far more expensive than standard TB treatments, second-line drugs can cause dangerous side effects. But Goldfarb's supply won't even begin to cover 300 inmates quarantined in the drug resistance ward, much less all the cases just outside prison walls. When a prisoner's term is up, he's released into the heart of Tomsk. Population, half a million. Healthy or sick, he's now free to walk these streets and ride these buses with unsuspecting citizens. Like any medical student, I knew about the disease. I knew its symptoms, but I had no idea it could be like this. Anna Kolosova doesn't know how she became infected with a strain of TB resistant to five drugs. I found out completely by accident. I went to take my driving test and I had to have a medical exam. They took an x-ray and they told me I had tuberculosis. Six months later, she began coughing up blood. On leave from medical school, she has been hospitalized ever since. If we had second-line drugs, Anna's prognosis might be positive. Without them, her prognosis is not positive in the least. Anna's case is not unique. In my care, I have another college student and other young patients with drug-resistant TB. Their symptoms can be eased. Their active disease may subside for a time. But the drugs that could save their lives are not yet within reach. <laughs> 